The GeForce 256 released by NVIDIA in 1999 was the first chip to bear this famous name. It was also the first chip to be called a GPU and the first chip to provide DirectX 7 support. This chip was a real technical milestone in the personal computer graphics history. The GeForce range is made of two main families of cards. The distinction is based on the memory type they are using. The first to be released was the SD RAM version, shortly followed by the DDR version and both released in late 1999. These two versions are using the same GPU, and only the memory type, frequencies and capacities are different. The GeForce SDR uses 32 MB of SD RAM memory. They are generally made of 5 or 5.5 nanoseconds memory chips. While capable of frequencies between 180 and 200 MHz, all these cards were clocked at the same frequencies. With 120 MHz for the core and 166 for the memory. But with these quality memory chips, the overclocking was made possible by design probably on purpose. The DDR version uses 32 or 64 megabytes of DDR memory. Again, even if the manufacturers used different memory chips, the card's frequencies were all the same. 120 megahertz for the core and 150 megahertz for the memory. While the DDR frequency was lower, its two transfers per clock cycle made it capable of 300 megatransfers per second, which would be equivalent of SD RAM chips running at 300 megahertz. The 64 megabytes SD RAM version is not known to exist. But there are actually Quadro Workstations cards with these specifications. These four cards has already been presented and tested by talented content creators and I strongly encourage you to watch their videos for a more thorough analysis. And now, let me introduce the two GeForce 256 SE versions. These two cards are based on SD RAM ones, but with some significant differences. One difference is the introduction of a 16 megabytes version. And the second difference is something about frequencies. Spoiler alert. SE is far from meaning Supreme Edition. This card is a classic GeForce SDR with 32 megabytes of memory. And this is a GeForce 256 SDR SE with 16 megabytes of memory. On the front side, the most visible difference is the missing TV output. But no major differences otherwise. But on the back, things are getting interesting. The SE version does not have any memory chips on this side. Making it a 16 megabytes card. You may notice the strange color of the PCB and the stickers. In fact, I got that card non-functional and I was able to repair it using the classic homemade reflow technique. AKA baking the card. And it took me 4 attempts to succeed. So, sometimes, it worth keep trying. On the front side, if you look closer at the memory chips, you may notice an important difference. On this standard SDR version, the card is equipped with fast memory. These cards generally came with 5 or 5.5 nanoseconds chips. This one has even faster memory with 4.3 nanoseconds chips. This may normally allow frequencies above 200 MHz. The SE version on the other hand is equipped with really slow 7 nanoseconds memory chips. That means that these RAM modules are rated for a maximum of 143 MHz only. You may have luck and be able to overclock them to a higher frequency, but that leaves you a really small margin of progression. Back to the slides with GPU-Z. My standard SDR version is on the left and the SE version is on the right. The majority of standard GeForce SDR cards have memory chips ratings exceeding the 166 MHz. For instance, a card with 5.5 nanoseconds SD RAM memory chips is normally capable of operating at 181 MHz. So by running at 166 MHz instead, it is not used at its full potential. These cards are easy to overclock, you actually have headroom for that. And it's almost certainly a design choice. For the SE version, the default memory clock is slower, with a 143 MHz frequency. Do you remember the 7 nanoseconds memory chips? Their maximum rated speed is also 143 MHz. It's not a coincidence. But with chips already running at full speed, no overclocking for you. Or a modest one at most. To add a cherry on the top, 
the GPU core speed has also been reduced from 120 MHz to 110. So SE definitely does not stand for Supreme Edition. When I started to search details on this card, I was first suspicious about its specifications. In fact, Wikipedia didn't even mention it. The first real clue was a Vogan's forum thread talking about a 16 MB GeForce 256. Apparently, someone else found a similar card, but was also surprised by the unusual specifications. Apart from this thread, on which I contributed later, I found very few information about an entry-level GeForce. But at least, the forum thread proved that this card was known to exist, and not a strange modified card. At this moment, I strongly suspected that this could be an OEM version, pulled from a pre-built system. A few months passed and I found another article specifically mentioning the GeForce 256 SE, 16 and 32 megabytes. As you can see, the article is in French, but hopefully, behind this computer-generated text-to-speech voice, I am a French-speaking person. Interestingly, the article mentions a price tag, 1190 French francs. This was the French currency before the euro and that makes something like 180 euros from year 2000. On the top of that, the mention of a retail price means that this is probably not an OEM version after all. The article publishing date is April 1, 2000 and I could not find any earlier mention of this card. This date is also important and this is probably not a coincidence. It's the release date of the first ATI Radeon. So why is that card quite unknown and uncommon? I don't have a definitive answer, but these are my suppositions. With the GeForce 256 SDR and DDR, the NVIDIA commercial range only had a mid-tier and a high-end card. The low-end segment was still occupied by the TNT2 card, released a few months before. So, from the end of 1999 up to April 2000, ATI had nothing really competitive to offer against the GeForce. The next real competitor would be the Radeon and the card was scheduled for around April 2000. Yes. There was the Rage Fury Max. But it was kind of disappointing. It was expensive, performed a bit worse and was not Direct X7 compliant. It was just a powerful card from the previous generation trying to close the performance gap, and not a future-proof competitor. So I will just ignore it. In April, with the release of the Radeon, the GeForce 2 would be close to a release as well. So my guess is that NVIDIA, or at least Guillemot and maybe a few other manufacturers, saw a window to undercut ATI. The plan was probably to release a budget GeForce 256 around the release date of the Radeon. So for me, this is why this card is mostly unknown. It's a late, budget release. Its lifespan should have been really short until obsolescence by the GeForce 2. The financial profit was probably small or non-existent due to its low price. Since the GeForce 2 was almost there, chances to damage the original GeForce sales were minimal. So yes, for me, the card was just here to ruin the party at the Radeon release. A really nice gift. As a fun fact, by looking at the card's BIOS hex dump, I found some interesting text engineering release, not for production use, NVIDIA Corporation. And this text is not only in my card's BIOS. I previously mentioned a Vogan's forum user which happened to have a really similar card. He dumped his card BIOS too and posted it online. The two files are strictly identical. Was that card released in the hurry? Well, we will probably never know. That's all for the technical details. I don't have any other elements about this card's history but feel free to comment or mail me if you have information about it. After this technical presentation, I also wanted to run a few benchmarks. My goal is primarily to compare my result with Pixelpipes's GeForce 256 benchmark video. He did an impressive job comparing DDR, SDR and Quadro versions in 32 and 64 megabytes flavors. So I set up a similar testing environment, and since I had a 32 megabytes GeForce SDR version along with the SE version, I can use it as a base for the comparison. With this card in common, and a little bit of math, I will be able to merge the two benchmarks and compare my GeForce 256 SE with cards that I don't even own. So this is my testing environment. A Socket 939 Opteron 180. It's a dual-core 2.4 GHz processor. 
and I am using it without overclocking. An ASRock 939 Dual SATA 2 motherboard. Two sticks of 512MB Corsair XMS. So 1GB of DDR400 with good timings. A Creative Auto G2 ZS sound card. And a random IDE hard drive. Because my WD Raptor RAID 0 died during the tests. But hold on. Before benchmarking, make sure to use the best of the best. Like this high performance thermal paste, and its exclusive applicator. I will put the link in the description down below. And these are the games I will be testing. Or more accurately, most of the games in the original Pixel Pipes video. But since I don't have, Need for Speed, and, Shogo, I will replace these two games by something similar. In all my charts, I used the GeForce 256 SDR 32 megabytes as the baseline. On all charts, this card is rated 100, and all other cards are rated relatively to this one. In addition to the test of the stock 16 megabytes GeForce 256 SE, I also tested several other configurations. The standard 32 megabytes GeForce SDR underclocked to the SE frequencies. And the 16 megabytes GeForce 256 SE card, but overclocked to a standard's GeForce SDR frequencies. Luckily I could reach these frequencies, even with the cheap 7 nanoseconds memory from hell. In 3D Mark 2000, no real surprises. The 16 MB SE performances are lower than a standard card. But so is the underclocked 32 MB SDR. And interestingly, the overclocked 16 MB SE performs as good as a standard 32 MB SDR card. 3D Mark 2000 seems to be insensitive to memory size. Both cards with DDR frequencies performs the same, the three cards with SDR frequencies perform the same. And both cards with SE frequencies perform the same as well. So frequencies for core and memory have an impact. Memory amount does not. The 3D Mark 2001 SE benchmark was the fastest to run. Unfortunately, for bad reasons. The 16 megabytes GeForce 256 SE was not able to run the tests because of its lack of memory. I was only able to run this benchmark with the underclocked GeForce SDR 32 megabytes. But that leaves me nothing really interesting to tell about the SE card performance. I was able to complete the test on 16-bit color mode. This seems logic since it takes half the memory normally used in 32-bit mode. But the results between 16 and 32-bit mode cannot be compared. So, I guess, no luck for this test. Unlike 3D Mark 2000, Quake 3 seems to scale well with memory capacity. Just as a reminder, the numbers are not in frames per seconds. It's a relative performance index against the GeForce 256 SDR 32 megs. The FPS values are just below the score, with smaller font. So, regarding playability, with an average 17.8 frames per second, the GeForce 256 SE 16MB will not be able to deliver a smooth frame rate on a maxed out Quake 3. The performance gap here is huge compared to the best GeForce DDR, with around 50% less frames per second. Sirius Sam the second encounter exhibits the same performance level as Quake 3, but seems less sensitive to memory capacity. On the charts, cards of the same type, DDR, SDR or SDRSE tends to perform similarly, regardless of the memory size. One exception is the overclocked SE with a score of 72. This result is surprising because the overclocked card seems to perform worse than with its base frequency. I thought the card would be around 82, but 72 is really low and I can't really explain this result. Regarding playability, all GeForce 256 are struggling with this game and you will definitely have to reduce the resolution to achieve a decent frame rate. Unreal Tournament 99 runs really well on all GeForce 256 cards. Even the 16 megs SE version managed to output more than 70 frames per second on average. All GeForce 256 cards performances are quite close, with around 20 FPS difference between the lowest specs version and the highest one. Again, memory capacity have less impact than the memory speed. Cards with same memory speed tends to have similar results. Same things with Unreal Tournament 2004. All performances are similar. They are all similarly bad. 
we have less than 8 frames per second of difference between the GeForce 256 SE16 megs and the powerful non-SE64 megabytes DDR version. Playability is bad, with low FPS on every tested cards. But this game is far newer than this GPU. And it can be mostly playable at lower resolution. Generally, with this type of fast arena shooters, performance is more important than eye candy. Once again, card scores can be easily grouped by memory speed. Memory capacity seems far less important. As I said previously, I don't own some games used in the initial Pixel Pipes benchmarks. I could have found some ISO image somewhere, but being too lazy to burn a CD, I tested a game I literally had at hand's reach. And it's also a racing game, or sort of. Alexandra Letterman 4, also known as Pippa Funnel in UK, is a horse-themed game. Mostly an adventure game with some horse-riding actions. Ride and take care of your horses while uncovering the dark secrets of the domain. Who needs a Porsche? Interestingly, it's a quite demanding Direct X7 game. The 16 megabytes GeForce 256 SE outputs around 17 frames per second, while a standard GeForce SDR can only get around 24 FPS on average. It's around the same performance levels seen in Sirius Sam or Quake 3. With this small data set of two cards in four configurations, it's difficult to make any relevant comments. But this game seems to scale on both the memory speed and the memory capacity. And at last, will Half-Life 2 be able to run on 16 megabytes? Sure it can. Even if it is possible to run Half-Life 2 with Forced Direct X6, the game has some issues. Issues like no flashlight, but it runs, and can be playable on cards like a TNT2 Ultra. So, to be honest, the GeForce 256 SE 16 megabytes cannot be considered as the lowest specifications card able to run the game. But still, it is possibly one of the lowest specs Direct X7 card in existence, and then, one of the lowest specs card capable of running Half-Life 2 out of the box without special config and arguments. I think the only other challenger to the title of lowest specs Direct X7 card is the GeForce 2 MX. Which I think, had some 16 megabytes versions. It would be an interesting battle to compare both with Half-Life 2. Regarding playability. Half-Life 2 is really playable with this card on the lowest graphics settings. Getting around 70 frames per second. But I am kind of cheating here, because Half-Life 2 is very CPU dependent. I had far less impressive numbers with a period correct CPU like an Athlon, a late Pentium 3 or a Pentium 4. So. I hope you enjoyed this video. I found this card very interesting and wanted to share my findings. This is not the kind of card that made the big story back in the time, not a groundbreaking piece of hardware. It's now quite forgotten, but this was the kind of card the teenager on a budget I was, could have bought back then. I wish you a nice GPU June, and see you next time.